I, um, I promise no PowerPoints. I'm not going to be able to promise Klaus to start at 1.45, but I will keep it short. I was asked to speak mostly on the uh, commercialization aspects or the establishing of one's company, uh, things having to do with uh, building a business. What I'll, I'll deliver a couple of extra nuggets that were not, would not be apparent from your um, itinerary here, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, so at the very top level, I was always asked uh, uh, what was the most difficult thing about building a business through the internet uh, era, businesses. My brother and I co-CEOs of a number of different things. And what I found is that that was actually a lot harder than it is to build businesses in the clean tech sector. In the internet, at the time all that was being formulated, you didn't have a business model. A lot of times you had uh, solutions that were looking for problems, and at other times you weren't able to communicate what uh, was the right price to pay for something. When you're generating electricity, for example, it's pretty easy to say why one needs it, uh, roughly what it costs and what the competing sources uh, would charge you. And so things like business model or modes of delivery or reasons that people should have the stuff are uh, no longer an issue uh, in, in the clean tech sector the way they were for us in the internet. Um, the other thing is, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to do this stuff with uh, really smart people, and that's not me or my brother, that's the scientists that are there in the first place or who have a fundamental understanding of how the physics behind things work. But what gets lost a lot of time between the scientists and the business people is something we, we heard on a little bit from Alexander, which is uh, the economics. And where you end up with electricity, just for example, so now I'm going to talk about Highmark. Next, I'm going to talk about a second uh, clean tech company we have. And then third, I'm going to finish on something else altogether, a little bit of a surprise. But in, uh, in the case of Highmark, we end up at electricity like everyone else does. But we end up there starting with a negative. Rather than solar or wind or hydro, which some could say is coming as a, a free or a cheap resource, it's, it's coming in from the sky. Um, we're starting with a waste. We end up at the same place, so the value chain is a lot longer. And that means that automatically, by definition, we're delivering economics that um, in cases with our competitors, uh, we know now, based on some of the projections, that we're by far, by, by uh, almost an order of magnitude, the lowest cost uh, competitor will be the last man standing when regulatory or other issues change or even consumer habits and appetites. And that's a huge advantage. So if you have any, for those of you who are establishing businesses, if you have anything that you can do or you can work toward that enhances your chain of value at, and, and reaching to the same endpoint, that's where you get a disproportionate bang for the buck. In the case of Highmark and in commercialization in general, what I would counsel strongly, and that's not because I went to uh, law school, is that you, you dot all your I's and you cross all your T's and you spend whatever it takes to get that technology into a clean uh, situation and onto a stable footing, whether it's from uh, patenting through to uh, how you register in the different jurisdictions. There might be some tax considerations there, but you should not let th that tail wag the dog. Make sure that, um, uh, for example, with Highmark, we had uh, started, n before my time, in conjunction with the Alberta Research Council building that technology. Um, t ten years later, which closed on August 11th here, uh, five or six, seven, eight weeks ago, um, we purchased that technology. It was easy for us. The due diligence was zip or negligible because we had been the only commercial entity of any scope or magnitude over those ten years that had ever contributed to the development of the technology. So we knew what we were buying. If you're buying in or in licensing things, be sure you've got a license that would be bankable in the eyes of uh, venture capitalists or others. And that would be my third point in terms of Highmark, and then I'll move on to the other entity. Um, it's no, there's no hell on talking in terms of an exit, even while you're going into something. Why? Because you might, it's not like being uh, uh, betraying or uh, otherwise uh, not loyal to your concept or your business. If you're not structuring yourself, to either do an IPO or to be acquired, you're probably building on some shaky ground or, or thin ice. You're not necessarily going to be attractive to the kind of capital you need. And by and large, you will probably not be attractive to the customers that you're going to want to, to work with, the meaningful, the very large ones, or the ones with the large sales channel. They want to see that you're seriously taking either a global perspective on what you're doing and that you have the, the foresight enough to uh, build something that's going to be uh, 
uh, attractive to others. And that could mean, uh, as it was for us and a couple of our other past companies, it could mean that you never take that option. You never, you're, you're not doing the IPO or the M&A. You're actually sitting there with a cash machine and that allows you to go and do other things. But if you're not building it to stand on its own two feet, you're going to be in, uh, in real trouble right at the outset in a structural way. So the second company that I'll touch, touch on, <clears throat> Um, we're doing a soft rollout of this. It does not yet have a website. You're one of the, the few audiences who've heard of this so far, but uh, uh, we've been running it under a code name and numbered company stuff. It's, uh, it's uh, been two and a half years in existence now. We've got about five or six patents, actually six as of uh, four days ago, Friday. Um, six patents in application. It has everything to do with what you may have heard something about in the algae uh, uh, sector uh, using the pretty remarkable characteristics of that life form to do some things and do them in a way that we know is unique again uh, on the face of the earth. We think that many of the technologies or the algae companies are going to have to come through either one or two of our patents uh, across that portfolio of six. So that's pretty exciting for us. Again, step back, be as strategic as you can. Take the big brains that you have available in your scientists, but don't betray them. Don't let them down by having shoddy or sloppy legals and everything else along the way, because if you're structuring this to uh, be a world-beating company or a world-class undertaking, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a patent infringement lawsuit out of the U.S. We already had one of those shots across our bow. It's only because we're now, the word is starting to get out. They all ignore you. They're happy not to even acknowledge your existence, whether at trade shows or what have you. But as soon as you start... Uh, convincing some customers or some potential partners and some investors that this might be the place to put their money instead of X, Y, and Z other company. Guess what? Whether or not those other guys in the U.S., I apologies to any Americans in the room, uh, it's great. They're aggressive and that's what keeps everyone on our toes. But if as Canadians we're not ready to stand up to it, we're in trouble. So as soon as they see you making any kind of success is when they start getting their lawyers to call you if you don't have a lawyer or your lawyers and we're uh, gratefully and happily in that situation right now. Why do I say grateful and happy? Because we've been prepared. We've spent the last two and a half years buttoning everything down and making sure we know where we stand with respect to the prospective competitors that were out there.